Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the program. This is Let's Talk with me, Julie Ali. It's the Wednesday edition and we're really very happy to be with you, very especially after the very long weekend. We do hope that you have arrived home safely. On the show this morning, uh, we're going to be talking to a historian and an archaeologist. She has joined us all the way from Palestine and she is going to share her story with us, which I'm truly looking forward to. And of course, the scarf that I'm donning today is in honor of our guest this morning, Abir Zayad. We'll also be talking to Faiza Sanders. She's going to talk to us about banting in the month of Ramadan and just exactly how you should be managing your banting diet in the month of Ramadan. And then we'll talk to Darlene, uh, Darlene, Darlene James. She is from El Dorado Park and we're going to be talking about the issue around drug addiction and drug trafficking. What exactly is happening in our townships? What do we need to know about uh, the movements of the peddlers in our townships and how we can make a difference? Well, we do hope we are able to make a difference. But first up, in honor of our guest Abir, and we do welcome her to the studio this morning. We're very, very pleased to have her here to talk about Al-Aqsa and um, issues surrounding the Palestinian people. Abir Zayat, salam alaikum, welcome to the program. Wa alaikum salam. Lovely to have you here, and um, I'm intrigued to know why you're visiting South Africa. Uh, my visit to South Africa it was uh, because many of uh, people that are coming from uh, South Africa, they're coming to Jerusalem and they told me that uh, part of uh, the people are afraid from coming and also the lack of knowledge that they have about the issue of Palestine. So I spoke with some friends here in Salam Media and they prepare my coming uh, and uh, uh, the main purpose of coming is to make knowledge about uh, what is going on exactly in Palestine, especially Jerusalem, uh, how to go to Jerusalem, uh, what you need to know about it. Uh, th this is the main aspect and also uh, some aspect about uh, historical, archaeological background about Jerusalem. Now, not only are you a historian and an archaeologist specializing in Al-Aqsa, uh, you've done many other things as well. You've been in, involved uh, in, in, in youth upliftment programs and a whole host of more. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, in Jerusalem, I, um, I work in many uh, activity. It's not, uh, not one activity because you can't be in one aspect in Jerusalem. Jerusalem have a lot of things that is happening on. And when you grow up in the old city and you have responsibility for the mosque, for the city, you need to work more. So archaeology is my work, is my uh, uh, love. But in the same time, I need to work with youth, with children, especially with women. Uh, this aspect that we are also working with them, working with the poor families, this is part of uh, the aspect uh, that we are doing all the time in Jerusalem because you can't just uh, stand by and say, okay, I'm archaeologist, I will not be involved in all the social problems that you are facing and all the political problems that you are facing. You can't do this. If you do this, you will be not giving what you are supposed to be give. And uh, we as a Jerusalem people, we believe that God was choosing us to be in Jerusalem, choosing us to be in Rabat all our lives. So uh, we're supposed to use this to protect the mosque as much as we can. And uh, to help the people who are protecting the mosque is a major issue of protecting the mosque itself. Now, obviously, there are vested interests in the mosque. Um, the Christians believe that, you know, they have rights to the mosque. The Israelis believe that they have the right to the mosque. And we as Muslims believe that we have a right to the mosque. We're all claiming ownership of the mosque. You as an archaeologist, um, let me ask the question first. 
why the interest in archaeology? And then you can respond to my second question about ownership to the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Uh, first, that I grew up in uh, the old city. The old city, it's a magnificent city that have a uh, building from different periods, some, uh, some houses that we live in more than 1,000 years ago. <sighs> So when you live in a place like this, and every aspect of uh, you see every day a different kind of building, and each building do, uh, telling you a different uh, story, and you listening to the guides, and each guide is telling different story, and I was all the time thinking, whom saying the truth, and how I will know the truth. So this take my way to archaeology and to history and to study to know the truth. To go to your questions, uh, first, that uh, normally the Christian does not claim that they have any right in the place uh, to clear this. Only Jew and Muslims. Uh -huh. uh, what uh, the Zionists say, that uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque was a temple before 3,000 years ago, and that they came before 3,000 years ago, occupied the city, and they built the temple. And this is why they have the right to be in, uh, to take uh, the mosque. Uh, from archaeological point of view, they was not in Jerusalem, and they did not build a temple in, uh, before 3,000 years ago in Jerusalem. From archaeology, before 10,000 years ago, Jerusalem was established as a village and turned to be a city before 4,000 years ago by the same people who are still living now, the Palestinian who was called Canaanite. They are continuity of living. They always say first temple, second temple. We will use the term of Suleiman temple and Herodos temple because it's more uh, clear and uh, more strong in from archaeology and history. Suleiman Temple, there is no archaeological evidence at all for it. Herodos Temple is something else. Herodos Temple is, uh, it was built 30 BC, but Herodos himself is Arabic guy, that he was forced to become a Jew when he was a kid, and he built a temple for all religion in Jerusalem, not only for uh, Judaism. And uh, the rabbi of Jew refused his building because he was not a Jew. And that building was destroyed 70 AD. That means this building less than 100 years. Muslims, for them, the mosque is the third important mosque for them, the first Qibla, the place of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj. Muslims arrived to Al-Aqsa Mosque 636. In that period, Al-Aqsa Mosque was destroyed since 78, uh, 70 AD. There is no building in the place. They start building 636, and they uh, inside the mosque since that period, around 1,400 years, they are inside uh, the mosque, and they never leave it. And of course, it's very holy for uh, Muslims uh, from different uh, aspects. But from archaeology point of view, that the, they own the place from 1,400 years, and they have a magnificent building inside. For example, the Dome of the Rock is the oldest Islamic building in the world. So when we try to compare, you can't compare uh, a temple that was built by Arabic guy for less than 100 years with to compare with 1,400 years. This is from the right point of view. Also, to say that you was before 3,000 years ago and you occupied a country, that does not give you the right to occupy the country again because you once occupied it. And even that from archaeological point of view, they was not there. The first Judaism, Judaism to arrive to Palestine, it was around four, uh, 500 BC. That's all. But the oldest period that they are spoken about, there is no archaeological evidence at all to, to say that they was there. All the archaeological evidence proved that they was not there. So now all archaeologists all over the world know this. But even that, uh, the uh, Zionist still does not want to speak about it, does not want anyone to give this knowledge. Even that they know it and know it that this is the truth, but they do not want it because all the myth of Israel is depend on this story, depend on their right of the Moromist land that it was giving for them and that they arrived there and occupied before uh, 3,000 years ago. 
All right, let's take an ad break. We'll continue this discussion right after. I'm speaking to the lovely Abir uh, Zayad. She's here from Palestine. She actually lives in the old city of Jerusalem, and she was telling me off camera that from her house she can look into the mosque and see exactly what is going on there. But because of the occupation of the Zionists, she is restricted from direct access to the mosque and she has to make her way to the mosque every day by car about three kilometers away from where she actually lives. But had she been given access as a free person in normal circumstances, it would take her a 10-minute walk to get inside of the mosque. But do join us right after the ad break. We'll continue our discussion with the lovely sister Abir Zayad. Lines are open. Do call in with questions or comments. talking to Abir Zayad. She's here from Palestine talking about um, obviously uh, the Grand Mosque in uh, Palestine or rather Jerusalem and the issues that the Palestinian people are subjected to under the rule of the Zionists. But before we do carry on with that discussion, I think she's very passionate about a public meeting that's going to happen here in South Africa and she's urging one in all to attend the meeting. Tell us about the meeting, Abir. Uh, it's uh, we will have different uh, public meeting. Uh, I I can't know exactly the the. Uh, the the details. The details, but you have it in Salam Media website, so they can uh, go there and see it. And we would like to have all of them there because we have a lot of videos, a lot of things that we want to show them about what is happening really in Jerusalem. All right. So tell us about your concerns um, that's happening. You've suggested as an archaeologist you do have evidence that there's illegal, I should imagine, uh, diggings going on under uh, the mosque. What is the problem there? Why are the Zionists digging under the mosque? And what are your fears about, as far as, an, from an archaeological point of view, you believe that that is illegal, it's, it's going to create a lot of problems. First, the whole city is registered as a natural heritage by the UNESCO. And it's uh, by national law, it's occupied country, and they can't do this kind of excavation without the agreement with UNESCO and with uh, uh, Jordan. But even that, they are doing this, and uh, the UNESCO had to try more than once to stop them or even to have a check what they are doing, and they kick the UNESCO out. So this is why it's, uh, it's not legal. And uh, even Israel archaeologists who are not uh, with the... Um, uh, Bible uh, point of view, it's not even for them allowed to be part of this uh, digging uh, or uh, what they call it excavation. When they first start, they start with the idea that they want to find the proof about the Suleiman Temple. And all the digging, they they done it since 1967 till now. Everything they found, it was opposite what they want. And the oldest thing that they found in that area to going back to the Roman period. And I, pres and I should imagine they've hidden all of that information. Yes. They don't want the world to know about the, the evidence that has come up. Uh, they, some of the archaeologists, they put it in the archaeological reports, but for media, they do not go, they do not speak about this, and they do not want anyone to speak about this in the media. So after years of digging now, they know that they can't find evidence, but even that they are still continue uh, digging. And we know that now that uh, the west side of the mosque and the, all the Muslim quarter and also Silwan area, the digging underneath it is make the foundation of the mosque itself and the houses uh, very weak. And already we have some houses that collapse because of this digging underneath it. So it's become very dangerous for the people and for the mosque uh, for both sides. And uh, we know that they are using as a synagogue, they are using part of it as a ways to make their way from uh, Damascus Gate to Morocco Gate to Sudan, uh, all other area. And it's very attractive for uh, tourists also, so they are making a good, a good income from it when they are asking the tourists to come to see the foundation of the temple and thing, things like this. So also they are having a good income uh, from it, from, from all the tourists that they are coming inside. 
And the Palestinian people and the people of Jerusalem living in the old city do not benefit from it at all? No, it's not allowed for us uh, to enter even to the uh, Burak wall, uh, which they call it the Wailing Wall. That's right. Uh, even that it's belonging for us as a Muslims by national law, but uh, it's not allowed for us even to pass from there. And this is why I need to make a big turn uh, to go to uh, my work instead of just going from uh, there, from the Moroccan uh, quarter to uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque. Uh, so, um, it's not allowed for all Palestinians uh, to go there. But it's not only the only place that is not allowed for us. There is many areas also that is not allowed for us to go. Some areas not allowed for us to live in it or to buy houses in it. Uh, some area we need to, to have a special permission to enter it. Uh, some uh, Even some stores is not allowed for us to go and they put in some stores uh, um, a sign say uh, it's free from Arab and things like this. So it's uh, it's very hard, especially in Jerusalem, to live. But even that you are continue living. And this is uh, uh, the digging, the, these uh, extraction of not entering is part from uh, our life there. But the, the harder thing is uh, when they are abandoning the people from entering to the mosque to pray. Mm -hmm. I can I identify with all of that because we here in South Africa too were subject to the apartheid laws. Alhamdulillah, we way beyond that 22 years later and we make the same dua that you too, uh, Palestinian people, would be able to shake off the shackles of apartheid. How difficult is it for you as an archaeologist? Is your life, has your life ever been under threat? Because you've brought some very important information to the world. Uh, of course. Uh, if you uh, been an active in Jerusalem, you will be attacked. Not only if you are archaeologists, also if you are active in other aspects. So uh, the first time to threat my life because I'm archaeologist, not because of other things, it was in 2010, and they put my information and my picture to be uh, killed. And also they fired me from my work uh, and uh, twice. And, uh, and what reasons do they give you when they fire you? That I do not believe that the temple of uh, Suleiman is exist, and as they write in the uh, newspaper, as I remember, and I believe that Prophet Muhammad had to fly from uh, make Isra and Mi'raj. Right. right. So uh, this is the reason that they, they put it uh, to fire you. To fire. An excuse to fire you. How did you get back? How did you get your job back? I did not get my job you, back. No. I, uh, I work now inside the Al-Aqsa Mosque for Jordanian uh, government. Uh, so I do not, it's not allowed for me to work in any Israel uh, museum or any, uh, or uh, in any project uh, with, All the, right. uh, with them. Please hold that thought, we have a caller. Assalamu alaikum to our caller, welcome to the show. Assalamu alaikum caller. As well, wa alaikum salam. G, go ahead, please. And assalamu alaikum to our sister as well. Uh, in fact, I must say um, it is very hard at times when we go through difficulties of uh, this nature, like uh, children in Palestine being bombed, including uh, civilians and so on. Um, we make dua every single day for the Ummah at large. When I make a dua, I add every person in my dua, and I also ask others to do the same. And the oppressed is also in my du'as, and the Palestinians, and all those people who are put out of their countries, and, and uh, their lands are taken over by others, are also from the oppressed. So yes, we, our du'as are with them, and also we ask them for their du'as. Inshallah. Inshallah. Shukran very much for your call. Salaamu alaikum, sister. Actually, the one thing I can say is that there are people who take us as terrorists. Every Muslim is looked at as a terrorist, but when someone else from a different religion does something, they don't see them as terrorists. But Allah knows the truth, and that Absolutely. is what we care about. Point taken, shukran. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam. 
Um, I also understand that your husband was in prison for a couple of years. 15 years. And when you went to Robben Island, you were very, very uh, emotional because it brought back uh, your situation, the situation of the Palestinian people yes. that are so oppressed. What, why was your husband imprisoned and how did you manage whilst he was in prison? Uh, I'm, uh, first, I married him after he got out from uh, prison. Oh, you uh, married him after, yes. alhamdulillah. Uh, alhamdulillah. But I have a lot of friends that they, their uh, husbands are still in uh, prison. Uh, but even that, when you, uh, just when I go there, I remember all the stories that I know about what happened with my husband. And my husband is still suffering from part of the tr uh, torture that they done against him, like when they fired his body. So it, uh, it's hard to go there to hear to hear about it. And when he was that prisoners, when he was speaking, all what is in my mind, he was speaking and I, in my, in my mind, I was seeing my husband and what happened to him. So this is, was so hard for me. And I think it will be hard for any Palestinian uh, to, to hear it because we are suffering from this and we're still suffering. And now he's speaking uh, in Robben Island about that, but he's already have the freedom. And our prisoners is still in the same situation, still suffering, and now they are in hunger struck. And we are worried about their lives. And it's, it's too much hard. And me, myself, I was in the prison. So I know the situation. For how long? I was not for a long time, but uh, each time they take me, they uh, beat me, they torture me in some way. So just to, to imagine, uh, that this is still going on Palestine. Uh, and sometimes when you go out of the country, you try to forget all the, uh, the things that you are living in. And uh, because our life in each small aspect of our life is totally controlled. Uh, uh, totally controlled. And you can't uh, walk from one place to another without the checkpoint, without stopping, all of this. And you are here, you are walking in the cars, miles and miles, no one is stopping you. You will feel freedom. And normally when we go outside, we, we try to test the freedom. And when I go there, I just like shift back to the situation that we are living in. And it was How do you hard. feel, Unite South Africa, you see what a beautiful democracy we're living in, and the thought of going back, and I know you have lots to go back to, your, your family, your friends, and that is your home. You'd never want to abandon your home. Of but course. how does it feel, the heaviness, I should imagine? It's uh, worried, because uh, I don't know exactly what to expect when I'm going back. Do you think you might be in trouble because you visited South Africa? This is maybe, yes. And we don't know what will happen. We hope that everything will be okay. But you can't know what is going mm -hmm. on. Normally in, uh, in Jerusalem, you don't know exactly what is going on with you on a daily basis. Because, for example, once I was going to my work in normal day, it was the first day after late, and when it just arrived to my work, uh, they attacked me, they broke both of my hand, they uh, beat me in all my body, they take off my headdress, they uh, grabbed me from my hair for half a And any meter. reason? without any reason. Mm -hmm. And after that, they take me to, to jail and they bring five witnesses from the soldiers that I attack them. <laughs> but the good that a brave woman taped everything and she put it in the media and that uh, because of what she taped, I was released. So these are the type of atrocities that happen on a daily basis yes. to Palestinian people. We've almost come to the end of the interview. What strong message do you want to leave the South Africans with as far as your message from Palestinian is? We have a message just to f not to forget Al-Aqsa Mosque and to come to visit it. I know it's very hard for us, but it's safe for tourists. So we are encouraging all Muslims to come to visit the mosque. Their coming is very important for us as Palestinians. It's supporting our economy, it's supporting our existing, it's make us feel that other Muslims are looking for us. Haven't forgotten us. you. No, and you can't 
know how much people are happy when they see Muslims in the street and it's full up the mosque with us because West Bank people are abandoning from entering to Jerusalem, Gaza are abandoning from entering to Jerusalem, some of us are abandoning from entering to the mosque. So when you came, you are following up the mosque, you are praying inside, and this is very important for us. And just to, the feeling that you're giving, you're coming, the feeling that is giving for the people is very important support for them. And it's it's safe, don't worry. It's it's not safe for us, but it's safe for tourists. For visitors. Uh, yes, so you can come, you can enjoy it, and you can pray in the same place where the prophets was praying, you can walk in the same place where they was walking, the, the Sahaba was walking, and even you will see some of the buildings that are from the period that the Sahaba saw it also. So, Rich in history exactly. and um, rich in spirituality, inshallah. Do know and the message to take back to the Palestinian people from us here in South Africa and everyone here at ITV is that you are in our hearts. We haven't forgotten you. We'll never forget you. And we'll keep the flag flying high for the freedom of the Palestinian people. Inshallah, our du'as and love with, uh, f with you and for all your loved ones back home, inshallah. That was Avir Zayar talking to us about uh, a little bit of history and uh, archaeology and the mosque in Jerusalem. And her appeal to all South Africans is please, please, please visit the mosque, go and make uh, salah there and just um, fill the hearts of the Palestinian people with your love just by visiting the mosque. So please let us uh, try and help and keep the Palestinian, pe Palestinian people in our du'as always, inshallah. Let's take an ad break. When we come back, we'll be talking to Daraline James about the drug issue in the townships. And we'll also be talking the Banting diet in Ramadan um, with a dear sister Faiza Sanders. So do stay with us. Welcome back, and in the studio we have Deraline James. She's from El Dorado Park. She is an anti-drug activist, and off air we were having a bit of a chat in preparation of the interview, and she became all very tearful and emotional. And I think anybody who has a challenge, very especially a challenge in this type of an area, if you have a loved one who is an addict, then I think you will understand her pain, and you'll understand why she becomes tearful when she talks so passionately about this issue. Darlene, morning. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Julie. Thank you for inviting me. My pleasure entirely. Are you okay to talk? Yes, I am. I'm okay. fine. Tears are good. <laughs> tears are okay. We do tears all the time. All right. Thank you so much. Um, you became an anti-drug activist really by accident. Definitely. It was because of your own story. What is your story? Sure. Um, it started a couple of years back. Um, my son was addicted to drugs and it was just, I actually up until today don't know how I got to where I am. And I often tell people I think it's just a calling from above that has been placed on my life. And God sort of allowed me to go through what I went through so that I can help and support other people. I always say that through my son's addiction, I have found my passion in life. I probably would have been stuck behind a desk in a uh, office, but I find myself supporting families and addicts in our community. And it was just a, a very dark space and time in my life where I think at the time my son was 14 years old as and young as that as young as 14 mm -hmm. and I just noticed you know at that age you don't think that something's wrong you just think that maybe it's just the behavior it's part of growing up you know the teenage phase the that they of teenage yeah, years not wanting to go shopping with mommy you know the isolation you know come with me to the mall now I'm rather gonna stay home um you know eating in the eating in the bedroom and you think that's normal our kids warm their food and they go sit alone but isolation is definitely one of of the signs that I tell parents to look out for now. Uh, the moodiness, the weight loss, um, you know, you just see the wardrobes getting emptier by the day, selling off Why? clothing. Ah, okay. Yeah, they start selling their clothes and you just see untidy bedrooms. I remember taking a picture the one day and one asking myself, but what's up with this child, you know, leaving his clothes on the floor all the time? And again, you just write that off for, oh, it's a boy. So what's the issue around the untidiness and clothing all over the floor? Um, your sense, when you're on drugs, your sense of awareness goes. So you don't see 
the dirt and you don't see the fault around you you know so that is that's another sign like if you go into a drug addict's room you will always find this plates there's old food immediately when i walk into someone's room at home where i get called in by parents and i walk into the person's room and i look at their wardrobe i'm able to tell okay yeah some of the signs you know some of the signs broken lighters without the silver pot in the front i used to wonder what's up with this child and all these lighters and why is the silver pot in the front, why is that off? And, and why then is it off? It was when they smoke the lolly, uh, it's a pipe that you smoke the tick in uh, from, you know, to get a bigger flame so that it can melt, you sort of take off. And when the gas runs out of the lighter, you sort of take off the silver part from the lighter. So that's another sign. Um, there's so much signs, like I said, the isolation, um, the weight loss, because tick, depending what drug the person is on, tick, usually, you know, you lose weight. The sleeplessness, you know, um, not being able to sleep. I mean, I thought that, you know, when someone's in the lounge or your kids are playing PlayStation till two, three o'clock in the morning, you think, oh, he's at home, there's nothing wrong. Meanwhile, he's not able to sleep. So it's so important for parents to have boundaries and rules so that when something happens that's not normal, you're able to pick it up. When you found out your son was drugging, what did you do and how long was that journey to him uh, cleaning up his act? And thank God you tell me mm -hmm. he's 11 months yes. clean now. Yes, he is. I think one morning I just woke him up and he was lying in bed and he was all twirled up full of cramps and I took him to our pastor evangelist Eden Constance in our community I remember at the time you know when you find out or you suspect your child's using drugs you never know what to do it's not like they have a headache and you just take them to a doctor there's a deep sense of of hopelessness of um, sort of shame that comes over you like what have you done wrong as a parent and I woke him up that morning and he was skin and bone and I've seen him being skin and bone but because I wasn't ready to accept the fact that it could be drugs I was almost avoiding it you, you don't want to confront so the person because you don't know what to do so you as a parent you in denial for the longest time and this morning I just one you morning, wish it away you wish it away and one morning I just woke him up and he was grumpy and edgy as usual and I said you're going with me to Eden this morning and you know we're going to test you and still in all of that he denied being on drugs and we took him to um evangelist Eden in the community and I remember getting there that morning and he just gave him one look and he looked at me and he shook his head and I was still in denial and I thought you know in my mind you can't just say he is on drugs by just looking at him you know what if he's not that's me being in denial and he later on tested him and I tell you Julie when those test results came it was like phew even though in the back of your mind you knew, I knew. that he yes. is an addict. Yes. How difficult was the path to his healing and what did it take out of you and your life? Sure, it took a lot. I mean, I, I think I became an addict. I was a codependent, full-blown co codependent. I, would, I, was so, I was so caught up in his addiction that my behavior was like his. I would sleep during the day and not open up the curtains because not knowing what to do, because it's like a part of you have, has died. Um, lie in a dark room, um, take some meds just so that you're able to sleep and not worry where your child so is. So your life was on hold or in limbo as well Absolutely. whilst this child was doing his tricks and Absolutely. his drugs. Absolutely. You wouldn't go huh. visiting or anything. And how, Just talk to us about the impact on your life. What was going wrong apart from you be, going headlong into into a phase of depression because that's exactly what it was yeah. you were in utter and 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 you were in utter depression yes what else was happening around you i was having you know not going to work on a monday work was falling apart my health was going backwards i wasn't going to church because i thought that you know god is punishing me for something so my spiritual life that went out the window my health i had to suffer from terrible stomach cramps because of the stress um 
my finances, my career, I wouldn't concentrate on a Monday. I would stay out of work because I was too tired because I was looking for him the weekend or he wouldn't come home on a Sunday. And what do you tell your boss? You know, your son's on drugs. Who's going to understand? And obviously there were times when I would say to them, you know, I took him to rehab and to them, they would think, you know, when, he, when it happens again, I would say my son again. And they would be like, but didn't you say you sorted this out mm -hmm. like last month? And now I realize even the discrimination in the workplace, you know, with moms not being able to say because addiction is is a lifelong disease. And so few people actually understand that it like cancer, like HIV, it needs to be treated and we need to put sort of support structures in place for addicts. And right now all we're seeing, it is the only disease that you get locked up for having and that you get expelled from school for having. So everything fell apart. Um, I lost my house, my marriage. Um, I eventually resigned from work, but that was after the presidential intervention because I just couldn't cope with, with life in itself. I, you lost your house uh, because? I got divorced, yeah. And you got divorced, divorced because yeah. you and your husband were not on the same page, page as far as your son yeah, is concerned, yeah. as it, far as his addiction is yes. concerned. A lot of marriages do break up because of that. When you have a child, a troubled child, it does uh, put a strain on the marriage and everything else, every other aspect of your life. But let's uh, take an ad break. We'll be back with you in a minute or two. Thank you. James, the anti-drug activist from El Dorado Park, right here in Johannesburg, is in studio to talk to us about this horrible scourge on society. And that, of course, is drug addiction. We'll continue this discussion after we've taken an ad break. We're talking to Deraline James. She is the mother of a recovering addict. She comes from El Dorado Park in Johannesburg and she's here to talk to us about the problem, the pro proliferation of drugs, not only in townships, but all around the country and globally, and just how it's eating into the very core of your brains, or if you find yourself in a similar, similar space and want to share some information with us. Back to you, Deraline, and how long is it that you were trying to support or trying to get your son off drugs? How long was that journey for you? Hey, it was, well, it felt like forever. It was about five to six years. Mm -hmm. It was five to six years of rehabs, of making loans. In and out. In and out of rehabs, trying everything, you know, putting him out. People saying, you know what, you need to put him out so that he can learn the lesson on the streets. Tough love. Did Tough it love. work? Yes. Um, you know what, as mums, I think it is our nature. God has designed us to love and to care. So... Practicing tough love by putting him out, you actually just, for me, I was destroying myself because the fact and the reality was that he was still on drugs. So that didn't help me. That I just did that so that people and society can see that I am doing something about it because that's the advice that they had given. So irrespective of how the advice destroys you, you just don't want to be that parent that, that doesn't listen. We've told her to put him out, but you still don't sleep, mm -hmm. you're still traumatized. Absolutely. How old is he now? He's 21. He's been clean for 11 months? Yes. How did his journey to recovery start? What is it you believe happened? What was that aha moment for him and you for that matter? I think that for me it was, I learned, I finally got to a point where I cut the apron strings where I realized that it cannot be that one person's addiction can have such a huge and immense impact on myself, my mom, my daughter, everyone on life. And I needed to realize that this child was, was God's child first before it is my child. And I completely handed over the situation because I was tired. And I started getting a grip on my own life. I started washing my hair again and, um, getting up and showing up because I wasn't doing that. I was behaving, I was almost like enabling an addict. his addiction because now he wasn't seeing anything better. He was seeing someone screaming, kicking and shouting. He was seeing someone making loans to pay rehab with money that they don't have. Who does that? Addicts do that. 
they use money and you know I money was, they don't have because they don't have and I was doing the exact same thing I was going to all the banks trying to make loans for expensive rehabs with money that I didn't have I was lying I was living a life not a truthful life just because out of desperation and he was behaving out of desperation and I was doing all sorts of funny things. I, I wasn't going to family gatherings. Who does that? Addicts do that. I was isolating myself from the world. Who does that? Addicts do that. You know, the weight loss, everything, everything about me was like that of an addict and behavior of an my addict. behavior. So when and how did you take control and started turning things around, not only in your life, but his life as well? In my life, I remember the one day I just picked up the phone and I ran out of money and I was tired of paying off debt, just rehab debt. And I phoned this guy, David Collins from Sharp Recovery, the foundation clinic. And I said to him, I know you're the director of this place there in Oakland and you need to help me, but I can't pay you. I just said that to him and he said, come and see me in an hour's time. And I went to see him and I sat with him and Every time he asked me a question about myself, I would respond by saying, yes, but my son, yes, but it was no longer I had died. And when I had found myself, he helped me find myself. I had to learn what's my favorite color, what do I enjoy doing, because all of that was lost because a part of me had died with my son's addiction. And I sort of understand, started understanding my value and the role that I have to play in my family. And when I started projecting wellness again, I think that's when my son's recovery started. I started going to church again, started getting up, doing things, little things that may you may think, but what it's just a hopeless to, state. Darlene? He was addicted to tuck. He was tuck. addicted to tuck, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it all started out with just, I always say, it's so... It's so difficult to bridge curiosity with a kid because I remember growing up and when I was at school, I tried cigarettes, you know, in the bathroom. I mean, we all tried something mm. naughty when we were growing up, but it wasn't as addictive. Um, I tried drinking, you know, when I was young, having a glass of wine or whatever, but it wasn't as just Today, unfortunately, it's drugs mm -hmm. and it comes in all shapes and forms and everything and our kids don't understand that you're going to try this one try and and that's you it. could get hooked what was it you believe uh, was that moment when you could see that your child had made up his mind that he's going to kick the habit and how were you involved in helping him through that journey because they do need support mm -hmm. no absolutely i don't think i had because of the years of, of pain and distrust, the trust that was broken down, you sort of, you have no expectations when, when you understand this addic addiction. Like you just live every day, every minute in that minute. So it wasn't like an aha moment where I've realized that he's actually quit, but every day it's just, it's a grace walk, every hour for him to stay clean. And but in my heart, and I want to speak it and release the positive words, I know that he's done. He's so excited about life now. He values his education because I removed him from school at a very young age. And I believe that that's one of the worst things we can actually do when we find out our kids on drugs. We don't know how to diagnose them properly. We don't know how long they've been using. We don't know what drugs they've been using. All we do is we find a rehab and we send them to the rehab. Not everyone needs rehab. So you've sent him back to school? Um, he's actually enrolled himself now. Oh, wow. So he's doing his grade 11 and next year he'll be doing his grade 12. Marvellous. This has obviously um, channeled you and your energies and your entire life in a totally different direction. Whereas you had ambitions of becoming a fashion designer, <laughs> you've now ended up running a, a, a support group in El Dorado. Tell us about it. Yes, we run a wellness centre that supports the uh, families that are affected by their loved ones that's on drugs. So every morning what I would do, um, I would pick up some of the addicts from an area, one of the hard hit areas, which is called Kersidorp in our community. And the drug addicts would just sort of 
wait on the side of the road. I have different pickup points and I'll pick them up with the bucky and I'll take them to the center and we'll spend the day there. It's just a safe place for them to recover. It's a place where they undo years of learned behaviors. It's a place where they find themselves. It's a place where they're out of the community during the day and they go back there at night. So if something goes wrong, they're able to come back the next day and tell me, Auntie, do you know what? This is my trigger or I'm not strong enough or, or whatever. But it's just about them finding out what's their favorite color, what are their strengths, where do you switch on a computer because... Do you do this on a daily basis yes. and for how long are you going to carry on with this? Do you believe it's going to make a difference in their lives? I believe it's definitely making a difference in their because lives. Because they go back to the street corners at night. They spend the day with you, but they're on the street corners at night again. They're very vulnerable. They're very open mm -hmm. to anything that's going down. I think when you have a proper support structure in place and when you find purpose in life, your purpose will make room for your gift. And when these kids know that inside of them they have something bigger than themselves, sort of nothing that sort of wants to sort of stray you away from that path, it's actually very hard for you. It's like myself, I often want to just find a normal job, but then every day I'm drawn back to this because I have found purpose. So it's about igniting that purpose in their lives and them understanding why they have been placed on this earth. So for approximately five hours of the day, they're with you and you give them purpose, some sense of belonging, yes. some sense of purpose. And you're hoping that if you carry on this for a couple of weeks or months on end, that uh, the light bulb will go on in their heads and they'll know Definitely. that they've got to turn their lives around. Absolutely. What about those that have been coming for a while, but they've lost and they just don't come back any longer? How does that make you feel? It makes me, it, it, I feel despondent sometimes. I actually shout at them sometimes. But I, you know what, once you've planted that, once you have taught someone something, it is installed, the seed has been planted. And wherever they go, you'll find that they don't come for two weeks. But once you fill that void with just genuine love, no expectation, because addiction is a void, a sense of unfulfilled emotional needs. That is also one of the causes of addiction. It is usually you have four causes of addiction. It's a false belief system. It's past guilt or trauma that happened. It's an inability to change self and current circumstances. You know, there's nothing I can do about this. I'm poor or, or whatever. Or sometimes it's, it's sort of generic. And once you find what that underlying factor is, was this person raped? Is they, are they from an abused background? Did their parents get divorced? What is it? And you start working from that and you fill that void. You know, it's, it's sort of holistic healing that takes place. Obviously, um, these children, these broken children are going to need ongoing counselling, number one. Mm -hmm. And it also sounds like um, there's an issue around um, no support system. Uh, no education and with mm -hmm. uh, no education obviously they're not going to find meaningful jobs mm -hmm. so they are further placed into a very very dark hole. How can you and your support group continue sustaining them because it takes money to, de to, to oh. do the sort of support work and how many children are you working with at any given time? Oh, at any given time on a day we would pick up like 25 and it's not kids sometimes the youngest will be 13 sometimes the youngest will be 10 sometimes there's someone of 40 you know so the ages vary and it's about 25 sometimes sometimes it's just 15 but I think in terms of having sustainable sort of solutions and outcomes it's it's simple things that people you know we look at this problem and we think it's so big but it is little things that the ordinary person can do that's still employed, that doesn't have time to sort of be in the community physically. And that's just by sponsoring a face cloth and a toothbrush because most of them have been chucked out of, out of home. And I assume you give them a meal, a hot yes. meal on the day as well. So really what you're saying about the support group is you're hoping that by your kind gestures, taking them off the street for a couple of hours, giving them a hot meal, uh, talking to them with love and compassion would get them thinking and, and put their lives into perspective, hopefully, if you do this on a, 
on an ongoing basis, you're not saying that you are healing them completely from their addiction. Mm -hmm. You're just trying to give, give them Support. some sense of purpose. The other thing I hear, Darlene, that's happening in townships, it started in El Dorado Park and, or it might have started in the Western Cape and I think El Dorado Park followed as well. And I have no doubt it's going to start flaring up all around the country. Horrible practice. Uh, and that is that drug peddlers and addicts are being killed. They're being picked up and they're being beaten to death. You've had that experience as well. P please tell us what is playing out there and what's the situation like currently in Aldo's and surrounding townships. Sure. Um, it takes me back to a couple of weeks ago where I think in my journey of four years, it was my worst experience ever, you know, where I you know, was at the police station and someone came, just cutting a long story short, coming, came running and saying that the community has gotten hold of this guy and they beating him. And I got into my car with my two kids and as I took the corner, there this group of people were, you know, and all you saw was metal baseball bats oh. and people hitting and all sorts of weapons. Mob justice. Mob justice. And... I don't know what happened at that moment. Um, I, I, people, you know, I was telling people, I don't think I was thinking at the moment. <laughs> I just ran into the crowd. And because a lot of people know me in the community, I thought that, you know what, maybe they won't hurt me if I sort of just throw myself over his body. And he was lying there and I ran into the crowd and Who I was covered he? him. He was a user. He was someone that was in that was allegedly involved in a in a murder that we found this boy's body the previous week under the bridge and people were saying that this guy that they murdered now it was him but he was just taken in for questioning so there was no evidence know, no evidence, evidence to link yeah, him to actually link him but he was taken in for questioning but I always say that we don't have the right to take the law into our own hands and we don't have the right to take a life and the community just went crazy. And what was so frightening that day, I looked at these murderers in their eyes and I just started pleading. I just said, please stop, like, but in Afrikaans, like, how oh, possibly feel just, just leave. I promise I won't say it to you guys. And they looked at me and they said, okay, auntie. And they said, and the one still said to me, can I have my t-shirt? And I said, sure, take your T-shirt. And But while I was sitting on this body, I felt him, then they left. And next minute, I just felt someone, I felt because I was sitting and my legs were open and I was standing so that the crowds would stop. And I just felt this body moving through my legs. And they had come back with a pick it up bin and they were, they had him by his ankles, like his head on the floor and they wanted to put him in the bin. And at that to time, dump him. to dump him, to take him further. And, but this is in broad daylight with so many kids. Was and he so dead gone. already? I think, I think he, was, he, he was dead already. Um, I still tried to give him some water, but the water just went, you know. And the more I was asking people to sort of make a circle, hold hands to protect me, because I didn't know when I was going to get that knock or that brick or, or something. It was just, this could be my child. My child was here at one stage and I would have wanted someone to protect, him. to protect him. He belongs to a family, irrespective of who or what he is. And I always say that we are not against individuals. We are against the activities and, and what they do. You know? Do you think that that activity has frightened people in the area? and frighten them off the issue around mob justice, number one, and to rethink this whole issue around drug peddling and drug addiction in the area. Do you think people are going to start thinking differently about it and start cleaning up their acts and clean up the area? Or is that very wishful thinking? I'm not, I'm really not sure. You know, it's, it's so hard to sort of give an opinion based on you know, what other people, because often you find that you think that, you know what, that was an aha moment, that was an eye opener and tomorrow the same thing happens or it doesn't happen. So all we can do is just remain hopeful that, you know what, it sent a strong message. It had to take the life of that boy and so many other boys in our community where we see that playing out because people feel so hopeless 
you know, I keep on calling the police, they keep stealing from me and nothing happens, the case gets thrown out. So we're going to start making examples, let's just beat them and dump their bodies. That's the feeling because we can't get to the real dealers. So they steal to um, to fund their drug habit, yes, obviously. Yes. And people are sick and tired of it. Yes. They're sick and tired of being uh, targeted all the time. Their possessions are, are being stolen. Their houses, are, homes are being broken into. Their girl children are being violated, etc., etc., etc. What do you believe needs to happen? How can we bring the hard ugly realization to our children not even to take that first step towards drugs and for the drug addicts and their families what do we say to them is there any glimmer of hope or is this a multi-trillion dollar industry globally that we're not going to be able to make a dent in I think you know what it all it starts with us as parents if you can start at home I wish that years ago if only I'd known that you know to break the silence and and the stigma that goes with addiction like we did with HIV AIDS and I always say that there's a yellow ribbon that represents a symbol of you know supporting addicts and their families I think society needs to become active play an active role I think parents need to start testing their kids whether it's an A student whether you black white rich poor addiction does not discriminate let us test our kids like we test for HIV like we test for diabetes it should become mandatory in our schools in our homes so that we can pick it up earlier rather than leave it for later. I think that we need to start seeing it as a d disease. I think that we need to start educating the world, the nation. You know, I believe that this is an African solution to a global problem. Educate them on how to confront, educate them on what to eat, what not to do. You know, sometimes, you know, your child goes into rehab for, for six months and they come out and the family celebrates and you find there's all sorts of fizzy drinks and sweet stuff and stuff like that. And that sort of just brings on those cravings and all those stuff again. So it's about following a healthy diet. It's about doing exercises, breaking down the toxins, sweating it out of your system. There's so many ways of, of detoxing and of rehabilitation. You know, it's about having that open conversation. How are you feeling today? Are you feeling grumpy? Your mood's not okay? Do you have withdrawals? It's about having those conversations at home. I know one of the 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 nice things in my home now with my son, when I must place a 10 rand or a 20 rand, I'm like, hey, my money's gone. And he laughs because he understands now that he's worked hard for this reputation and he knows that I am still in a process of recovery and by me being able to speak about it as freely and him saying, mommy, you must place it, you left it in the car or you left it, whatever. That's how we rebuild sort of relationships and our families. I just think it needs a change in thinking. We need to stop discriminating. We need to support families and mums in the workplace. We need to create awareness by that yellow ribbon. We need to see during the month of June. The month of June is International Month Against Drug Abuse. That is on the 26th. That day comes and goes and nothing happens. Substance abuse is the new struggle that faces South Africa. And we need to fight it with the same passion, with the same determination that the youth fought back in 1976. But all we see is like there's like just once off events there's nothing sustainable we know is there something we can do that you believe would sustain this fight against drugs yes for 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 once we can sort supporting by supporting addicts by having sort of hubs in communities for addicts to go to you know by understanding the disease education the first thing that i remember with galen and Corsi johnson there was many education drives, um, marches, awareness marches. People say marches don't help. They're not meant to impact. They're just meant to show a mother like myself or whoever else that people are thinking about you. We, we do recognize that this is a problem. And in order for anyone to sort of pay attention and to gather and garner support, there needs to be awareness. After awareness comes education. After education comes solutions. So a march is the start of a solution. It's not the impact as yet, but it's the beginning.
brilliantly said and that's where we leave it and we pray not only for your son but for addicts globally and for their families may God make it easy heal them and heal them completely and to just heal this broken world that we're living in Geraldine James it's been wonderful having you on the show go well and lots and lots of strength uh, to you and your loved ones and keep up the great work. Thank you so much. That was Edeline James, the mother of an addict. Uh, she's now an anti-drug activist in El Dorado Park in Johannesburg and let us all do our bit. Let's hold up the flag. Let's try and heal our loved ones, our homes, our communities and society at large against this horrible scourge on society. An ad break now and when we get back we'll be talking to Faiza Sanders about how to bend in the month of Ramadan. And we're into the final interview for this morning. It's a very short interview and uh, we're going to be talking banting and the interview is short obviously because we've had Faiza in the studio before this time around we're going to talk about the banting diet and banting in Ramadan how difficult or easy is it and is it doable Faiza assalamu alaikum welcome to the program Lovely to have you here again and in the previous interview we spoke comprehensively about the banting diet. This time around we need to know about banting in Ramadan, the do's and the don'ts. So what is it that we ought to be doing or eating or what should we be looking out for when you're fasting and you break your fast and what's, how should your meal be looking in Ramadan? Okay, um, Ramadan is a great time for people to be banting. Really? Simply because... When you're banting normally, you fall into a habit of what we call intermittent fasting. You generally fall into this quite easily, where you go for long periods without eating. In fact, we have different um, formula for, for actually using intermittent fasting with banting for various reasons. And one of the things is most days I do fasting, which would be... Can I just interrupt you there? Um, I know that there was a workshop at some stage two, three weeks ago in the Bosmont area by Dr. Rustin and uh, her group of people, which they do every Ramadan, you include a pre-Ramadan, to kind of bring people up to speed and prepare them, very especially diabetics, for the month of Ramadan. That being said, um, if you're a diabetic, can you in fact go on the banting diet? Yes, in fact, you should be banting if you are diabetic because what the banting does is you're lowering your carbohydrates, and as soon as you lower your carbohydrates, your need for insulin lowers substantially. And what drives diabetes is insulin. So you can see the, con the connection between carbohydrates and insulin, and that is why it is one of the foremost ways to actually treat diabetes is with fasting. So it's a great time to do this, and why we did this a couple of weeks before Ramadan was because if people hadn't bent before, it's a good idea to start a couple of weeks before. There are some um, side effects that come with, with banting. In and the those would be? Well, you might get some cramps. Um, you might end up having some real low, low energy periods throughout the day. Um, you need to up your water during that time. You also need to up your minerals, like possibly just add more salt to your water. Um, and you might have some headaches. It's like with anything you've done for a long time. If you leave it, you're going to have some side effects. If you go off coffee and caffeine, you're going to have some side effects. All right, can we take an ad break? We'll be back with you in a minute or two. We're talking to Faisal Sanders about uh, the banting diet in the month of Ramadan. Please stay with us. Um, you, I'm sure, will be able to pick up some amazing tips on how to lose some unwanted weight in the month of Ramadan and also get you on track to be healthy, fit and fine, not only in Ramadan, but way beyond, inshallah.
we're talking to Faisal Sanders about the Banting diet, very specifically in the month of Ramadan. Now, Faisal, a lot of people, myself included, um, are waiting for Ramadan, hoping that we'll kickstart a proper eating plan, lose a bit of weight in Ramadan, and then stick to a, a sensible eating plan after Ramadan. If one decides to go the Banting route and you are a Banting coach, is it best to come to you first and then you refer us to a doctor or go to our doctor and they refer us to you? How does it work? I think it's best to go and see your doctor first. Okay, the doctor, Any diet that you're deciding to, uh, to, to undergo? Absolutely, because we don't give medical advice. I need to understand certain health conditions, but I use food to be able to change um, the way to deal with that. So I don't give medical advice and I would prefer for people go and check with their doctor if it's safe for them to do so. We find more and more doctors are open to discussing banting and the benefits of banting. Are there any particular type of people or people with any particular types of conditions that should stay away from the banting diet or diets in general? I'm sure that there are certain diets, but you know, banting isn't a one size fits all but it will definitely benefit most people. So I would say, if it was my opinion, everyone should be banting. Um, you just need to understand what works for you and what doesn't work for you. And even within banting, there's certain things that don't work for everyone. For instance, I have a terrible problem with wheat, and that's fine because I don't include that in banting. But diet, dairy products are a definite part of banting, and I have to stay away from them. I have very bad reaction. So it's important for people to become mindful and understand their bodies. And through banting, they actually learn to do that. So how, what do you replace in your banting diet? Because you've cut dairy out, and I should imagine dairy is a big part of banting. What have you replaced it with? I try not to do a replacement of things. What I find is when you're trying to change the way that you eat, um, you can't satisfy yourself with a banting bread from what you just what homemade bread tasted like. And so it's best to try and find new favorites, to work with a whole different way of doing things and to change things so that people are not hung up. You see, in your mind, you know what cake tastes like and nothing you substitute in those ingredients is gonna give you the same satisfaction. So just make new things. So I try to teach people how to cook and bake um, for banting and also to take the things that are your favorites and make slight adjustments so that they fit within the rules of banting. Um, you did indicate before the ad break that Ramadan is really the right time to start perhaps a banting diet. Obviously with someone like yourself, a banting coach or go to your doctor, get the green light from him and then start the diet. Um, what, is the, what is the typical suhoor and iftar meal going to look like for a banter? Okay, one of the important things is, with banting we want to go back to the way we did things in the past. If you think about how our grandparents used to feed us, one of the important things that is getting a new resurgence out there in the, in the world right now is bone broth, okay? Basically it's making your own stock, using bones, because when you are on a diet, and fasting is, is like um, an elimination diet, okay? It's, it's a holiday for your body. It's a holiday from digestion. It's a holiday from all those things that it does on a normal day. And just like a holiday, you get away feeling amazing when you come back from it. So it's a time for the body to clean out. Now, bone broth is amazing because when people fast, they tend to be, they lose weight, yes, but they lose a lot of muscle as well as water during that time. So when you're using things like bone broth, you're getting a lot of minerals, you're getting amino acids and proteins, you are conserving muscle during Ramadan, during that long period of fasting. And so what I would say is you start off the day with, with bone broth and you break your fast with bone broth. So basically you're talking broth. about a soup. It's a soup, yes. Mm -hmm. So you make a basic soup with, with, with good bones and you cook this for 24 to 36 hours. With vegetables. You put the veg vegetables in at the end, okay? And then what you can do is you can make a clear basic soup and then you can add different things as you need it. So I would probably do bone broth once a month, make a whole batch and freeze them in portions. And as I need that, I would take that out. So that's giving you gelatin as well. And gelatin is great for your joints. It's great, great for your skin, hair and nails. And instead of buying expensive skin products, this is going to feed your body from the inside. So for people who are convalescent and old people who have lost their appetite, this is another important thing to be able to give them is bone broth. What I would say during Ramadan is, I know it's tradition to have that table laden with all the sweet and savory. 
all the samosas and yes. pies and so when you does. break your fast i know that it is tradition also to use a date but dates are very high carb especially for someone who has health problems and insulin resistance to suddenly pop a date is 19 grams of carbs in one go and so you can break your fast with water and then have your bone broth and then if you then say your prayers and then come back and have your main meal before you go off and do prayers again, that is the best way. So it's not to overeat, not to go to bed on a full stomach, and then to add in some very good fats that will give you the sustenance as well as the energy throughout the day. So I would suggest having eggs fried in butter for breakfast and having your bone broth. Those are the kinds of things. and No also cereals. Drink, no cereals whatsoever mm. because they haven't got much nutrient and they make you hungry. Mm. And also they're not part of the way that we do things with banting. We cut out all grains if possible because of the inflammatory nature of grains in our bodies. Uh -huh. No breads, no samosas, no pies. We have alternative things that you can <laughs> bake. And there yes. are some wonderful things. You can make rotis, you can make pies. There are ways to make dough with flaxseed flour and different ingredients. And it's just a different way of doing things. So yes, you can make the treats. You can actually have a wonderful eat with amazing table laden with good quality, amazing fatty, rich cakes as well. Oh, wonderful. Unfortunately, we've run out of time and you've mentioned the magic word there, having a table laden with the most amazing cakes for Eid. So we'll try and get you in again sometime soon to talk to us about how to prepare our amazing banting table for Eid day. So definitely we will be talking to you soon. Thank you so much for being with us. Go well and assalamu alaikum to you. Thank you. That was uh, Faiza Sanders, uh, the Banting coach. She's based here in Johannesburg talking to us about Banting in Ramadan. I suggest if you are planning to go that route, give her a tinkle and she certainly will get you on track on your Banting diet and to help you through Ramadan. That's all we have time for. Inshallah, we'll meet up again Saturday morning at the same time. As always, Assalamu alaikum and khudafiz from me, Julie Ali. Ya hala, ya hala. Ya hello, 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 ya hello,